what is this biquad filter and why am i sort of you know taking this as an example essentially this is just a sort of more detailed example to try and bring out the how the folding actually works right uh, it can be implemented in practice so this biquad filter by the way is you know and if you look at this architecture you will realize that this is some kind of an iir filter structure uh, this is usually called a second order section in many kinds of uh, filter implementations these kind of second order sections are considered as a nice building block right uh, sort of larger higher order filters are usually composed as a cascade of such second order sections because these have some nice stability properties and so on as far as we are concerned none of that matters right all that we care is there are some computations to be done this is you know it, it's a nice representative data flow graph corresponding to a dsp application now when i say data flow graph the first thing that we can basically see is this is equivalent to this right that is to say this block diagram that i have shown on the left is equivalent to this data flow graph that i am drawn on the right okay and uh, why am i saying that you know this is equivalent and so on because if you look at it right this block diagram has like a certain number of registers drawn on it right these rectangles basically can be thought of as registers but when i actually want to sort of look at the data flow graph i need to have each individual edge separated out so that i can clearly sort of identify what are the dependencies between different operations so you'll notice in particular that you know there are a whole bunch of edges going out of uh, operation number 1 in the data flow graph whereas in this block diagram right there is only one edge which then sort of splits into multiple edges right logically they are both exactly the same they are conveying exactly the same information nothing different between the two okay. so i am going to just stick with the block diagram for because it's sort of easier to look at and understand the other one gets a little messy right the important thing to keep in mind is for example if i want to find out how many delays are there between let's say something like this right 1 to 8 it has two delay elements on it why is that one of them is this and the other is this okay so you need to sort of keep that in mind and say that for every edge every pair of vertices in this i need to be able to look at it and say okay how many delays are actually present on the connection between them it may not be one direct edge between the two it may be sort of something which is branching off into multiple places but i should be able to find the path between 1 and 8 for example and say how many delays are there on it so i'm going to further assume that i have a certain type of hardware over here right uh, what are the kinds of operations that i need to perform i need to do additions and multiplications right and i'm going to assume that the hardware is such that the addition can be done on adders with a pa equal to 1 that is to say you know it's just a combinational adder followed by a register right a simple one stage pipeline the multipliers on the other hand are a two stage pipeline right which means that it has a pm equal to 2 so this is exactly you know case 2 in the in what we just discussed earlier it has a pipeline latency of two clock cycles but an initiation interval of one which means that on every clock cycle i can give it a new set of inputs and tell it to multiply them that output will come out after two clock cycles now one small bit of analysis that we can do on this data flow graph is to say that it has cycles right so clearly this is a recursive data flow graph which means that i should be able to compute an iteration period bound on it right and the iteration period bound in this case is very straightforward it basically just has two loops right there is this one which goes through this 1 5 and 3 and the other loop which goes through 1 7 and 3 right the 1 5 and 3 loop basically has one delay on it whereas the 1 7 and 3 loop has two delays on it and if i look at the iteration period bound it is the maximum of this 1 plus 2 plus 1 divided by 1 and 1 plus 2 plus 1 divided by 2 in this case it comes out to be equal to 4 right so what does that mean it basically means that if i am trying to schedule this without making changes or without unfolding it and so on i can sort of anticipate that the best possible iteration period bound the minimum number of clock cycles that i need to finish one iteration of 
this is going to be four time units. Okay. Now in this particular case, I can also see that the critical path, right? There are multiple different paths through this circuit that essentially have the same length, but the longest such path is also four time units and is equal to the critical path in this case. Okay. So in other words, if I can sort of schedule it out in this way to get to the critical path, I'll find that, you know, this actually makes the best possible implementation for this circuit. So from all of this, I can say that, uh, you know, if I have uh, one hardware unit for addition and one hardware unit for multiplication, right? That basically tells me that the minimum possible folding order that I can have is four time units. Right. So there are basically, I mean, two ways of looking at this. One is that the critical path itself is four clock cycles, right? So the minimum folding order, minimum time required for finishing on iteration is n equal to four. Okay. But that's, can that actually be achieved in practice? It's not always necessary, right? So in other words, what I'm saying is that if you find that the iteration period bound is some k clock cycles, it is not necessary that I can actually find a corresponding hardware architecture that is able to finish it within k clock cycles. Right? You might have to do some other things like some retiming, pipelining, changes to the architecture and so on before you can actually get it to that. But in general, you should be able to get to a folding order of to that folding order by sufficient and by, by suitably modifying or suitably transforming the graph. Now if I am able to implement it with a folding order of n equal to 4, right, the interesting thing is I can look at the number of operations that I have, right, I basically have 4 addition operations, right, operations number 1, 2, 3 and 4 in, uh, the, uh, as labeled in the diagram, which means that the hardware utilization efficiency is 100%. Okay? Basically what it's saying is if I have one hardware adder and within 4 a folding order of four, that is four clock cycles, I finish four additions. It means that on every clock cycle, I'm doing one new addition and therefore 100% utilization. Okay. Similarly, there are four multiplication operations to be done. And if I finish this also within four clock cycles, I will be able to get 100% utilization on the multiplier as well. Okay. Remember what I said about the multiplier being pipeline. So in such a situation, what I care about is the initiation interval. As long as I can start one multiplication on every clock cycle, it will also correspondingly mean that I will finish one multiplication on every clock cycle. It may not finish on the very next clock cycle, but on in steady state, I will always be getting one output per clock cycle. So both of them, in other words, if I can get a sort of folded architecture with n equal to 4, would have 100% hardware utilization. So I am going to sort of, you know, magically give you the folding uh, sets, okay. These things over here are basically, I am going to call them the folding sets, right. So there is one folding set corresponding to the adder, one corresponding to the multiplier, right. What does that folding set corresponding to the adder have? It has a sequence of numbers in it and the order is important. Even though I call it a set, the order is actually important. So I should probably call it a folding sequence instead, right? So that folding sequence corresponding to the adder basically is four comma two comma three comma one, which basically says that operation number four, right? Happens at time instant zero, okay? Then operation number two happens at time instant one. Operation 3 happens at time instant 2 and operation 1 happens at time instant 3. Okay, so that is basically what that first folding sequence corresponding to SA means. Right? And SM is the folding sequence corresponding to the multiplier. It says that operation 5 happens at uh, phase 0, right? So these are basically the clock phases, right, 0, 1, 2, and 3, okay. So operation 
5 happens at phase 0, operation 8 happens at phase 1, operation 6 happens at phase 2 and operation 7 happens at phase 3. Okay. So that is the implication of having these folding uh, sequences. Now how did I come up with these numbers? We will get to that later. Right now I just want to say if I have these numbers somehow magically given to me, does it correspond to a valid architecture and how do I interpret that architecture? So the first thing that we can do is, you know, remember what I said, you can basically go and compute the df value on every single edge in this uh, uh, block diagram, right? And what should it be? If any one of the df values is negative, it means that there's a problem, right? This sequence that we have come up with, the folding sequences is invalid, okay? So I basically need to go through each and every edge present in this data flow graph and find out whether the df value is negative. If it is not negative, that is good. It means that this is at least a valid folding sequence. But after that, the next question then becomes, okay, what do I do with it, right? How do I build an architecture corresponding to this? So the df itself is given by this equation that we have over here, right? I just basically rewritten what I had earlier. So let's do the computation for a couple of examples, right? So df from 1 to 2, this 1 to 2 essentially corresponds to this edge that I have over here, right? And what I'm saying is, what is the tv, that is the time corresponding to, uh, the time when operation number 2, which is the destination, is scheduled, it's at time 1, okay? So tv is equal to 1 and tu is equal to 3 in this case, right? And the pu, because it's an adder, right, the source, that is to say operation number 1 was an adder, it has a latency of 1. There is one delay element which I have over here, so w is equal to 1. And n in this case is equal to 4. Okay? Do this entire computation and you come up with this number df of 1 to 2 is equal to 1. Good. So it's valid. Um, question, how is tu equal to 3? So what is tv, right? So the edge that I'm talking about is from 1 to 2, right? So this basically corresponds to operation changes. This corresponds to u, this corresponds to v, okay? So when was operation number 2 scheduled? This is v, therefore tv is equal to 1. I'm just reading it off from the graph. Okay. Similarly, in this case, this is u and which means that pu is this number 3. Yeah. And similarly, I have this w is equal to 1 in this case. Okay. Another example, now 5 to 3. Okay. So what I'm looking at is this one here, this edge between these two, right? So when I have 5 to 3, what I find is that this, this is V and this is U, okay? So TU is equal to 0 and TV, right? So this is going to be U, this is going to be V and this is going to be TV equal to 2. So, this is TU, this is TV, this is PU because it's the multiplier, right? Remember that I care about the latency of the source. That is to say, I want to know when the multiplier has finished operation. That is given by its latency 2. And I do this entire computation and I find that DF is equal to 0 in this case. I can repeat this for all the edges that are present in the graph. Okay. And in this case, obviously, you know, because I gave you the numbers over here, you can probably guess that every single one of those edges is going to come up with a positive value for df. Okay. Now, I have straight away given you the final sort of architecture also that comes up as a result of doing this, right? So you can see that the first thing is I have given the df values for everything over here, right? This is directly from the textbook. The df value that we computed, df of 1 to t or 2 is over here, df of 5 to 3 is here and so on, right? 
So every one of these things can be computed and you will come up with a set of numbers like this. You will notice that, you know, this df from 1 to 8 is equal to 5. This is the largest number that we have. Okay. And now the next question is, given all of these df values, what do I do with this? How do I sort of translate this into a hardware architecture? And that is what is given above this hardware architecture that I have drawn over here. Now, if you look closely at this, right, you need to sort of interpret what is going to happen over here. Right? Let's try and relate this to this block diagram that we have. Right? So the first thing that I can notice over here is what is it that happens on the adder when the phase is equal to zero? Which operation is happening on the adder? It is this operation. Op four happens on adder at phase zero. Okay, and the question that I can ask is, where is op four getting its inputs from? Okay, one input comes from multiplier, that is operation number six, and the other input comes also from the multiplier, operation number eight. Now, if I go to this architecture, right, let me look at the inputs to the adder, where are they coming from, right, and look in particular at time instant 0, right. So what do I have over here? If I look at what is coming into the adder at time instant 0, I can see that it's coming from the multiplier. And this input over here, in fact, is basically saying, input to adder at t equal to 0 from the multiplier with 0 extra registers. Now, what does that actually mean, right? In order to understand that, once again, go back to this diagram, I need to see what would be the df value between 6 to 4 and between 8 to 4, okay? And if I look at this, the df value from 6 to 4 is equal to 0, right? And that essentially corresponds to this one here. On the other hand, if I want to clear this and say this one over here corresponds to df from 8 to 4, okay? Because it has one register on it, this one over here corresponds to this register that we have over here. Okay. So effectively, in other words, what I'm saying is at time zero, I have shown that, you know, the two inputs that you have to the system are coming from the multiplier. Both of them are coming from the multiplier. One of them is with zero extra delays on it that corresponds to the edge from six to four. The other one is from eight to four. It has one delay, one register on it, one value of df, right? Therefore, we take that output from the multiplier, delay it further by one register and then feed it in to the adder at time instant 0. Similarly, if you can go through this and find out what happens to the adder at time 1, at time 2, time 3, right? And similarly, what are the inputs to the multiplier? So for example, if I take the multiplier at time 0, first of all, I find that the input is A, right? Which corresponds to this operation number 5. Okay, I, I, you know, I have not really shown the coefficients over here, but operation number five, assume that it has a multiplication, constant multiplication with the coefficient a, right? Now, the other input is coming from the adder directly with zero delays on it, right? This corresponds to df equal to zero, right? And if I look at it, what I'll find in this architecture is that what is the input coming to 5? It is coming from 1. And I have this value over here. df from 1 to 5, right? In other words, the input to 5 is coming from an adder with df equal to 0, which corresponds to 0 delays on it. Right? And if I look further at this last case over here, what I have is, if I consider is 1 to 8, right? That happens 
when is operation number 8 scheduled? If I look at it, operation number 8 is scheduled at time instant 1. And what I find is that at time 1, this input which is coming from here is coming from this point which is 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 equal to 5 as the value of df which basically corresponds to this. Okay. So now you can basically see how I have done this. All that I really needed to do was assign values of tu and tv, uh, assign values of the folding sequence to every one of these operations. Once I have done that, just draw the architecture, right? Put an adder, put a multiplier. And for each one of these things, the choices that I have, take the output of the adder, see where the inputs are coming from at a given time instant. Right? So for operation number zero, for uh, operation number one, for example, where are the inputs coming from? One is an external input, one of them is coming from the adder itself. Right? At what time instant is it scheduled? Find out that time instant and at the appropriate time instant, make sure that the data is coming in from either the adder or from somewhere else. Okay. So you can systematically, in other words, construct this entire hardware architecture once you have computed the DF values. Okay. Alright, so this entire discussion so far has been, if I somehow magically gave you these values for, DF, uh, for the TU, Right, that is the different uh, folding sequences. You can calculate the DF values. First of all, check that the sequence is valid. And from that, construct the hardware architecture. Obviously, the interesting question is, how do I come up with that sequence in the first place? Okay, And that is essentially what the problem of scheduling is.